Thank you. Uh, actually, normally, you know, what, being on that Selective Service Board, I've never been called to duty. Since we, in the 20 years I've been on that board serving, we just practice once a year, and uh, uh, we haven't had a draft, obviously, in that many years. But anyway, uh, glad to be here. Uh, again, uh, last year we did talk about siphons, and I changed up the PowerPoint a little bit this year, so hopefully it's not the same old, same old if you were here last year. Um, again, we're talking about dosing siphons and pressure dosing um, as opposed to a gravity system. And hopefully be able to share some of the advantages to that over just a gravity system. Uh, I do appreciate, uh, like uh, this morning, uh, the history that uh, Dan Olson shared with us this morning. I thought, I thought that was extremely interesting to see how far we have come in, in the United States when it comes to wastewater management. Uh, from, from some of the information that he shared this morning, uh, I, I just can't imagine that uh, rivers on fire and the way uh, we polluted our waterways. Uh, so we, we might think that we have a long way to go today, but we have come a lot farther. Um, one of the reasons we're here as a group is there's opportunity out there. Sure, there's new construction, but with the, the time of transfer law that went into place and effective uh, inspections on properties that are sell selling, we're seeing a lot of systems that would otherwise pass on to the next guy uh, are now being uh, failed or deemed to be failed systems and have to be replaced. Hence all of this. I mean, without that industry to uh, improve on the wastewater world, uh, we would be out of a job. So uh, a lot of the the systems that are out there that are failed may be due to old age, uh, never were installed to uh, maybe the, the straight pipe to the ditch. We talked about that this morning. Uh, a lot of that thing is, a lot of that uh, stuff is getting taken care of today. Other issues may be like uh, systems installed that were not meant for that particular site, uh, the wrong design of system for that particular site. A lot of that, I re uh, I've seen where years ago it was a septic tank and laterals, that was to an the answer to every site. Well, we've seen through time that uh, those systems failed, some system failed in short order because of poor soil conditions, site conditions, whatever. So uh, one of the problems with leaching fields uh, is uh, over time they decline in the ability to uh, absorb wastewater. And again, it goes back to the right design for that job site. It might be, uh, you know, very, very, uh, poor soil makeup and not conducive to uh, uh, subsoil treatment. And therefore uh, leads to ponding. Uh, I know uh, my son Jason is a time of transfer inspector and, and he's seen on a number of sites where you walk the lateral field and, and they're wet or, or they're seeping or uh, you can you can just visually see that they've been leaking. Uh, today we want to talk about advantages to dosing. I, I am not one to say that dosing is the only way. I think whenever we can do it, gravity, it's uh, if we can do a gravity system, it's the most efficient. 
most cost effective, but there are times when dosing is uh, a good way to go. Um, when we talk about siphons, we're not typically seeing them used with leach fields, but typically uh, the secondary treatment system that we see these used with is a sand filter. So then we would call it an intermittent sand filter, so it's not, it, it gets dosed, but it gets dosed non-mechanically with the siphon. Ways to dose, uh, there's two most common ways are the dosing siphon, which I'm here to talk about, and the electric pump. Uh, pump systems, and this, you have to forgive me, but this first batch of slides is somewhat skewed towards the siphon. It's uh, uh, actually the manufacturer of these siphons allows me to use these slides so he would prefer I sell a siphon over a pump, but I'm saying there's more than one way to dose. Uh, the, the, the downside to, of course, a pump is it's mechanical. It's prone to failure. It's prone to power outages. Without power, you don't pump. Without power, you, your siphon still works. Uh, the dosing siphon, which you see up there is a model 313. It's a three inch, uh, three inch trap with normally a four inch discharge and the 13 means it's a 13 inch drawdown. So when we install this in our tank, when this uh, siphon uh, cycles, it draws down 13 inches of water in a 500 gallon compartment. So that's roughly 25% volume of that 500 gallon tank, which would be approximately 125 gallons. We also offer <coughs> the 417 siphon. It's a four inch uh, trap. Uh, about twice the volume of the 313. We recommend that anyone building a sand filter for a five bedroom system and up use the 417 because of the sheer volume of water that this uh, releases versus the 313. The 313 we use on a sand filter up to four bedroom. And depending on how much fall you have on, or grade you have on your site, you may want to use the, the 417 if you're real limited on the amount of fall from the tank to the sand filter. $100 difference in the cost of the tank with one siphon over the other, so it's not a big difference, but I've heard uh, one regulator say uh, from Warren County that dosing a sand filter with the 417, he actually had a squirt height over his head. Uh, so it, it really puts out a lot of volume versus this one, and we'll talk about that shortly. The siphon is uh, non-corrosive materials. It's all PVC, poly, and stainless steel will not break down in your wastewater. So they'll last indefinitely. Basically what a uh, siphon does, or a siphon chamber or tank does, is it stores up wastewater like a pump tank would and then automatically will draw down at a certain point. And it does that non-mechanically, so no moving parts. Uh, that's the nice part about it. No breakdowns, no pumps to replace. But you have to have plenty of fall on your, on your uh, site for this to work. You can't 
siphon uphill like you can pump uphill. Okay, so this will require your your site with a, in a sand filter situation or installation to have at least probably seven foot of fall from your inlet to your tank to the discharge of your sand filter. And that would be a minimum if you built your sand filter to code. Um, so it wouldn't work on every site, but it works on quite a few. And you, do, and you can do a uh, sand filter size reduction with the use of a siphon. Uh, with a siphon, you can go from a 240 square foot per bedroom sand filter to 180 square foot per bedroom <laughs> sand filter. And with a pump, you can, go, you can drop down to 150 per bedroom. So, the extra cost of either a siphon or a pump in dosing is offset to a certain degree depending on how you figure your excavation and your materials for your sand filter. The cost of that extra dosing equipment is offset by a smaller sand filter plus providing you a better product. Intermittently dosing a sand filter is, uh, allows you to distribute your wastewater over the entire sand filter, whereas a gravity sand filter introduces wastewater only on the leading end. The operation of a single dosing siphon I'll go through this rather quickly, uh, but, uh, and I'll kind of use my pointer to demonstrate a little bit. As the liquid fills the dosing tank, the liquid, the level of the liquid in the tank and in the siphon bell rise at the same rate. You can see uh, here we're at the bottom of the bell. That would be after the, the siphon has dosed. Okay, as the water level rises in this tank, this airspace is being forced down into the trap. So, okay, once the liquid reaches the outside vent pipe, it creates an air seal. As the level of the liquid continues to rise in the tank, the liquid level in the bell continues to rise but at a much slower rate. At the same time, the head of water in the tank exerts pressure on the air trapped in the top of the bell and the long leg of the trap. The air in the long leg of the trap is forced towards the invert of the trap. As you see the water level coming up, it's forcing air in the bell and the trap down. The liquid in the tank reaches the high water line, which we found to be about three to four inches, and it's the same every time, but it's three to four inches above that PVC. So we always position that trap so we're just right at the inlet to that third compartment or an inch below. But the liquid reaches the high water line the volume of air is forced around the invert of the trap and out through the discharge leg of the siphon. The escaping air relieves the back pressure within the siphon and the liquid inside the bell will rush up and fill the siphon trap, thereby starting the siphon action. Then the liquid is drawn down out of the tank until the liquid in the tank reaches the bottom of the bell. Then the siphon draws air and the siphon action is stopped. So it draws down and once it reaches the bottom of the bell, that's when it stops. I uh, had some field photos this year of, uh, of a tank, a three compartment tank with a siphon in it. We. Uh, uh, put quite a few of those out this year and uh, 
um, seem to be working well. But uh, this is a 1,750-gallon, three-compartment tank with uh, model 313 siphon. One thing I wanted to, and I, I don't know if I missed a slide, but I was going to talk about the differences in specs on these two siphons. This one has a starting gallons per minute of 72 gallons per minute. And as the head of the water in the tank draws down, it will drop down to about 45 before it shuts off. With this siphon here, the model 417, with one inch bigger trap, will actually start at 150 gallons per minute. So that's a lot more water uh, at one given time. So that's why we recommend using this one on a larger sand filter where you may have, say, like a 900 square foot sand filter and you've got lateral pipe through your rock or through your easy flow or flow tech material, which I'll show you later. But you've got orifice pipe that you're trying to load with the siphon. And that's why we offer two different siphons. Haven't sold very many of these because mainly most of the sand filters are going to be four bedroom or less, two to four bedroom. The, uh, the lighting in here makes it kind of hard to see, but I just wanted to show you on a three compartment tank, and I'm sure many of you have seen them, but there's three compartments. Basically, it's a, a combo tank. It's a septic slash dosing combo tank. And in this first compartment, we have your inlet line with your baffle T. In the second compartment, we have a solid baffle wall with a uh, four inch crossover. And that's, of course, where the filter, the effluent filter, would, would go. And then in the third compartment, which is on our 1,750 gallon tank, approximately 500 gallon, that is where the siphon is installed. And we're not the only manufacturer out there that installs siphons in tanks. And there's several that do, but they come with the siphon in it. You don't have to set it up. Whereas if you order a three compartment tank with a uh, pump chamber, you're, you're probably setting up your own, your pump uh, riser, your pump and float switches. This comes set up, ready to go. And uh, we, we typically try to make sure our siphons are primed with water, because without being primed with water, they, they, they won't function. They won't work. They have to be primed. That trap must be filled with water. That means in the winter months, when it's cold like this, we, you know, our tanks sit on the, on the yard, and they'll go out and maybe get primed just before they go out, or if it's very cold, we'll, we'll have the contractor prime it. Three compartment tank uh, equals three, three risers, three covers. Uh, you want to factor that in whenever you use a three compartment tank. You're not just risering one hole or two holes, but three. Um, it always makes sense to move that tank down the hill as far as you can, shallow it up as much as you can so that you're not buying risers from guys like me. If you put it where the old tank was and the ta old tank was, had five feet of cover on it, and guess what, you, are, you, you have to shallow up your secondary treatment anyway, you might as well move that tank down the hill, shallow it up, and save cost on risers. 
Don't get me wrong, I like to sell risers. But. This is a discharge to secondary treatment. Uh, as you can see, the, the discharge is quite low as what you would expect on the inlet. The inlet versus the outlet on a siphon is, on our 313, is about 24 inches. So right away you, use 20, you lose about two foot of fall through that siphon tank. Pros and cons to using this, the con would be you need the fall. You need distance, you need a fair amount of uh, grade to make that up. This is uh, a contractor using what we would call geosynthetic aggregate product. Uh, the uh, brand name was Easy Flow. We happen to sell FlowTech. Uh, basically, it's polystyrene peanuts bundled uh, around uh, uh, corrugated tile that has uh, that is perforated. So it is synthetic rock and pipe. And many of you have already seen it. You probably used it. But has been become more common because good gravel, good rock is hard to find. It's more expensive to truck, more and more expensive to uh, buy. And, and the quality varies. So this is a collection system on a sand filter using easy flow. Here, uh, the contractor has built the collection manifold on the discharge end of the easy flow. They built a collection manifold out of four inch pipe and fittings. From the collection manifold, uh, then they just extend the discharge pipe to daylight on the sand filter. And then uh, you can also see they've used three mil fabric to cover up the, uh, the easy flow before they install their filter sand. This uh, looks like the same thing, but this is actually the sand filter distribution system using the same product. So they have installed the, the 24 inch uh, filter sand, DOT washed concrete sand that meets spec and then they've installed another layer of the uh, easy flow. Since this is pressure distribution rather than gravity feeding to a distribution box, the tank sits over here and this particular contractor, he went from four inch down to three inch, down to two inch header, and then he's using two inch laterals through the easy flow. Here, uh, the contractor is using uh, expanding foam to clo close up the ends, the, uh, the manifold end and the opposite end of the easy flow. That keeps the water, once that uh, siphon or pump, you could do it, he uses that on a on a pump system as well, it keeps the water from running out the ends, or at least minimizes it. It keeps it distributed over your sand filter. Here we're showing a uh, clean out inspection riser at the end of, of each uh, pressure distribution lateral sitting on top of the sand filter. Here you can see the sand. 
He's used a uh, two-inch uh, conduit long elbow sweep. You can do the th same thing with 245s. Probably don't want to use a, just a straight pressure 90 because if you've ever tried to get a a jetter or uh, you know a, say a jetter around a 90 de degree corner doesn't work so good. So basically, the purpose for that is to be able to inspect and uh, troubleshoot. If you are having trouble with the sand filter, uh, you could potentially jet those laterals. Say if you had some uh, plugging of your, uh, your or orifices, you could get at them without uh, digging. Here is uh, kind of the final, final picture. This happened to be a 15-foot wide uh, sand filter. So there's one lateral for every three feet. So and each bundle of the Easy Flow is three foot wide. So and the center one has the the drainage pipe through it. So. We've got five laterals. On the opposite end, we've got a manifold feeding those five laterals. I'm kind of a, a, a big believer in quality. And I think that you know uh, we as an industry have really made strides and continue to make strides towards quality. And, and I kind of drew up, an, I had an uh, equation up there on my last slide, and it said, Quality design plus quality materials plus quality workmanship equals a quality septic installation. I'm a firm believer in that, that you take away one quality aspect of that equation, say you have a bad design or you don't do a design and you just drop in quality materials with quality workmanship, how long will that system work? Probably not very long. So design is important. Work with your engineers, your county people, make sure you have the right design. And then I don't believe we should ever skimp on quality products or quality materials. Whether it be the sand for the sand filter or the tank or, or PVC pipe using uh, a quality PVC pipe versus a cell core PVC pipe. You know, maybe I, you know, I'm thinking I'm saving a few bucks to pad my pocket. Well, you know, you, you slip up on, on quality materials and you might be back or maybe you won't be back. Maybe it'll be the next guy that's back to fix the problem that you left. And lastly, workmanship. You know, if you have a great design and you have really great materials, but then you do poor workmanship, you're still not going to have a quality system. So I just want to leave that with you before I open it up for comments and qu questions that quality design, quality materials, quality ma workmanship equals a quality installation. And I think that's what we're all about. So thanks for your attention. And I don't know how much time I've got left. Maybe I'm, I'm only halfway through. So you guys are going to get out early. But actually, I would love to answer questions about uh, anything I've talked about or um, siphons. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. I stick them in my own tanks, but I can sell the siphon. I mean, but. Darwin at Municipal sells siphons. I know that's how I got started, buying siphons through Municipal Supply.
Now, I, now we buy enough of them, I go direct to fluid dynamics. And, and we started buying this siphon. I don't think Darwin carries that. This is going to be probably 5% of our siphon sales. This will be the, or maybe 10%, and this would be 90%. So, yeah, they can be installed in other tanks. I know uh, Darwin has said that uh, he's had people pick them up and think they're going to install a siphon tank in, in their own tank or, or a plastic tank, and it doesn't work out so well for them. Because it's kind of important, I, I, you know, maybe uh, getting a good seal on the discharge. If you have to cut a hole in a tank for the discharge of this, you got to get a good seal, um, whether it be plastic, fiberglass, or concrete. So that's a challenge. We cast the seal in place specifically for this application and precisely so that you know, we're not cutting holes in tanks. Other questions, Kendall? On the line where the siphon feeds the a sand filter you've shown there, that just comes into a T and it just it just discharges. You talked about squirt off the big one. <clears throat> So will the sanitarian come out and check the squirt off that? Is that one of the things that they're going to be doing? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the counties that we work with uh, typically would like to inspect a sand filter twice. Yes. They want to see the tank in the ground. They want to see the collection uh, layer of your sand filter in place before you cover it with sand. And then they want to come back a second time when you dose that sand filter. Whether it be gravity, they want to see that pure gravity feeding to a distribution box. They want to see that your distribution box is leveled and, and plumb. If you're using a pump or a siphon, they want to see some sort of a squirt. Because if you're uh, using a siphon, or pressure dosing, you want 100% distribution. That's why you're able to do a reduction on your sand filter. So if you're actually siphon dosing to a distribution box, you're really not gaining. You're not doing anything different, really. Put a lot of water there fast. Right. Uh, so they want to see that two inch Two inch laterals through the rock or through the flow tech, and they want to see some evidence of a squirt. Normally, they want to see anywhere from uh, 18 inches to three foot of squirt. Uh, as I said on this one, we had over head high, and uh, but 150 gallons per minute as opposed to 72. That uh, pushes a lot more water at one time. Even flow to each pipe is going to be critical to have even amount of slope or, or virtually level on the header. We want it to be about level. Yep. And then yeah. Yeah. And a little bit of fall on your laterals. Drain. Yeah. And and typically. It's hard to do with easy yeah. Flow because they move to a lot. Right. And even that home that they had there, you get some movement in that, is that But pills? we would want to see the holes down, uh -huh. the orifices down, so they could drain out. Somebody told me that they wanted them up here in Polk County and then just a few down to drain on one of those. Well, I... I in the inside easy flow. Inside easy flow? I, I don't know that there is a right or wrong answer to that. but. Uh, there's three sets of holes and easy flow in there scattered yes. the block. So it's in all directions. Right. I don't know. I just thought that was off. You can get a lot of squirt height inside that. Yeah, it's I don't I don't see that that would make much difference. So your recommendation is that I would put them down. Quarter inch holes on two inch We use five sixteenths. 
we, we believe five sixteenths on a siphon, three sixteenths typically on a on a Pressure. pump. Yeah, but I don't mean to interrupt you, but the people can't hear the questions. So oh, okay. Could you, could you repeat them? Sure. The answer? Sure. Right but I'll try that. But the size of them holes still needs to be in the design process. <coughs> right. Just saying you're going to use five sixteenths inch holes, you should know. And I don't know. We've talked about that. They yeah. need to be sized and they need to be the right distance apart. The problem yeah. is, I, I can't, I mean, I don't, um, you can't go to your siphon manufacturer and say, well, what is, what is the spec I should have for, because the varying amounts of grade loss vary on every job site. You know, with pumps, we always, we're looking at head by distance and rise. Well, with the siphon, you're looking at, at a distance and drop versus rise. <coughs> but we found, we found that 5 sixteenths tends to work well. And I, I think going smaller, you know, seeing how it's a, a non-mechanical dose, uh, we want to make sure those orifices stay stay open. But in most cases, the county has to approve the pipe size, hole size, distance. Right. They're going Each to county. To design, whether you know, most counties does. I've seen. Um, I just choose to not to try to reinvent the wheel when it comes to siphons. I I want a siphon that I can trust and uh, it's going to work every time. And uh, so that's why I just, I buy them. I buy them and put them in our product. But you need to, I think you should reiterate, Steve, about to, if there's any sanitarians listening or any guys that think they're just going to use them, you need to reiterate that you better have plenty of fall if you're going to try to grab it that siphon because that last one we did, I mean, you know, we tried to tell them, okay, but we're going to end up out in the middle of that beam field. And we did. It's down the hill a long way. So. Yeah. Uh, George's comment was to re to reiterate with uh, contractors and regulators that when you use a siphon, you should you should uh, check your site with uh, with a determine how much uh, fall you have on that site. You need to be pretty certain of your your inlet line. What's the depth? You can't just walk on a job site and say, "Well, I believe I've got seven foot of fall." Well, if your your tank is uh, three and a half feet to the inlet flow line, you no longer have seven foot of fall. So that's very important in in uh, the design to. Uh, utilizing this type of system. I have delivered a siphon tank out to a job site, and as soon as I pulled on the job site and the hole was ready for me to set the tank, I didn't even unstrap the tank because I knew, I knew that they didn't have the elevation. So we went back to town and got a pump tank. And uh, so very important to uh, do your homework, and whether you're a regulator or contractor, because um, you certainly don't want to install a siphon system and then have to put a pump at your discharge of your sand filter. That would be kind of counterproductive. Tim? Have you ever had one come out of prime or not? I have never had one come out of prime. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Have we ever had one come out of prime? Not that I'm aware of. Of course, I'm not going back to check on them either. So, but I've never had anybody um, uh, call me back and say that during a time of transfer inspection, they found that one has lost prime or no longer works. Ryan? Uh, 
Well, uh, oh, right. I keep forgetting to ask the question, Reed. Sorry about that. Uh, Ryan asked the question about alarms on a siphon. Uh, I didn't. I don't know that they're required. If they are required, I, I'm unaware of it. As far as the code is concerned, uh, if I could look back, uh, showing you the siphon in that tank, there is an overflow pipe, uh, so it will not back up in the in the house. It's not going to stop cold, but you really don't want that happening. I think it would be a good idea, but I don't know that anybody does it. Because if the water level, if that siphon doesn't uh, cycle, eventually the water level is going to rise and it'll go out that overflow. That's not going to be good for your secondary treatment system because then you're no longer dosing. So if that's not caught, you know, over time, it's just become a gravity system. If you had a, if you had a uh, alarm, you would probably know that. But as far as being required, I haven't seen it in the code. And to my knowledge, no one that I know of is doing it. Absolutely. Uh, his comment was the overflow needs to be high enough that it's not going to circumvent the, uh, the uh, uh, action of the siphon. I mean, uh, that's definitely true. Um, another thing we've, we've seen through experience on a three compartment tank, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we, we try to set the siphon discharge at uh, the optimal position because the, the least amount of fall loss through your tank, the better, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna make, make it two and a half foot of fall when we can get by with two. But I have seen it where in the process of filling the third chamber, water ran back into the second chamber before the siphon dosed. What that means in, the, in that tank, the water level is going to get one inch high, possibly before the siphon dosed. In other words, the siphon was just a, an inch too high. Should have been a little bit lower because it would back feed into the, the crossover pipe. Not a huge deal unless it's six inches. I mean, if it's a half inch or an inch, not a big deal. But uh, we try not to, I mean, that we've moved our siphon down so that optimally you want it to dose about an inch below the inlet. If that goes into the overflow, for some reason this has failed, it won't restart itself, will it? No. It's done. No. His, uh, he said if for some reason it's stopped working and starts running over into the overflow, will it start again? No. Uh, I found that, you know, if uh, sometimes you have to, I've never had to reprime a siphon other than maybe when we just brought it out to a job site. We try to run water from the outlet into this trap, uh, but um, after the pipe is hooked up to the sand filter, you can't do that. So there's two ways of getting water into that uh, siphon then. One is to reach down in the riser and hold a hose up to this PVC pipe you're forcing water into this bell, which will fill this trap to prime it. The other would be to get in the tank to take this bell off to fill the trap. The easiest way is to, to take your hand and hold a hose, garden hose, up 
here, shoot some water in there, and prime it that way. I've never seen one that just stopped working, not one of these. But not saying it won't happen or hasn't. Are all the counties you're delivering in allowed easy flow or the same? George's question was, are all the counties allowing easy flow or the synthetic aggregate in lieu of gravel? It is in the code, yeah. And yes, the ones that I've, I mean, the ones around Pella, I mean, Marion, Jasper, um, uh, Powashik, uh, I don't know, so not too much in Powashik, but Mahaska, I think most of them are. I mean, rock, is, let's face it, it's hard to come by. It's um, hard to find. I mean, some, some regulators have said, I want you to get it at XYZ rock quarry. Well, not everybody can get it from there. I mean, they, do, they don't have that much rock, and if you have to truck it 75 miles, it gets kind of expensive. Any other questions? What kind of, uh, some sanitarians say you gotta have access to that, what you do, and to keep that rinsed off, like when you pull your filter to rinse it. Have you, Jasper County's one of them that says they want you to hose that thing off. I don't know, does it get filled up on it? Well, um, uh, Kendall's comment was some counties wanna see this uh, siphon looked at when when uh, you're servicing your affluent filter. Frankly, uh, rinsing off this bell is not really doing anything for the operation of this sand filter, or this siphon. What I would recommend is that you make sure this thing is cycling. You, you uh, train your customer that every time he services his filter, he should look at the water level in this thir third compartment. And actually, the water level should vary. Every time he looks, it should be different. If the water level is almost up in the riser of the tank, running over into that overflow, he should be calling the contractor or, or me. But rinsing off this bell just rinses off that puts it right back into the tank or into the affluent where it can be pulled out into your sand filter. What I would recommend is when you have your tank pump that this chamber be pumped as well and then it wash, be washed down and any sludge that does collect that gets through that filter is pumped out. I think that's very important. Um, but washing this off is doing nothing, really. Unless you're pumping out the tank. Have, you had any trouble with powder, uh, laundry soap? Have we had any trouble with powdered laundry soap? Not that I know of. But it's fairly early, and you know we've we've probably been doing siphons now for eight years, seven, eight years, that's quite a while, I guess. I mean, you should see it if, I mean, if you're gonna see it, but I, um, if people are faithful about pumping their tank and faithful about cleaning their fluent filter, this should work well for a long period of time. But, but I think uh, pumping a septic system is, is crucial. I mean, you don't let it go 10 years and then, you know, like a lot of systems we see, uh, you know, it haven't been pumped in 20 and it's backing up in the house. And you do that with this or a pump, you're going to ruin your secondary treatment system because you're going to pump sludge out into your sand filter.
Was that one of these? No. Typically, if you have an opportunity to, as a contractor, to visit with your consumer, homeowner, um, I think it would be wise to instruct them that you just spent 12, 15,000 or whatever on a uh, septic system. Very important to maintain it. You know, I, I kind of use the adage, uh, you don't go buy a new truck, put it into service, and then wait for it to fail. You do maintenance, you do periodic maintenance. And uh, the old systems that went to the ditch, yeah, you could probably get by with that 30 years. But not these systems, not, not the uh, uh, systems of today. You're gonna, you're gonna have failures. So it's important to educate the homeowner pump their tank, service their filter, help them to understand what they're looking at, if possible. Anything else? Any other questions? Or we're about out of time. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate your attendance.